we know, we know, I saw, we saw in the Kantar TNS talk, that people understand dietary messaging. On the whole, you ask any person in the street what they should be doing in terms of diet, and they will tell you. The reality is, though, it's very hard to do that in the environment we have. We have an environment that is um, offering us food at every opportunity. In my lifetime, and even in my children's lifetime, that has changed a great deal. Um, we can now sit on our sofas and have almost anything we want. Um, we can be stimulated to buy things we don't really want through social media, through TV advertising, and we and it's you have to have superhuman convictions in in um, your health really to resist some of those special offers that we see, see in our supermarkets. So I'm going to be talking about the UK's reformulation program, which is um, about making healthier um, choices easier. And by that, I don't mean having a few <coughs> more healthy options on the menus in our supermarkets. It's about the default, the everyday, the regular becoming healthier, because we know that there's evidence to show that that will help us improve our, our dietary health. We've seen the food industry in the UK lead the way in the world in salt reduction. Our foods, our bread is now 40% less salty than it was 10 years ago. That's led to the majority of us having lower salt intakes and that's um, improved our health. It's reduced the risk of having high blood pressure and reduced the risk of having, uh, of having um, a heart attack. Mo and, the, and the reality is that's happened without Behind the scenes, we as individuals haven't really known about it. So the sugar reduction program learns those lessons. Anyway, I'll stop talking and show a few slides. Um, so I'm afraid I've got quite a lot of slides for England because I work at Public Health England. So we've got lots of English data, but these m mirror what um, Elspeth has just told you for Scotland. We measure our children in primary school in England at the beginning and end of primary school. So that's when they're four and five in reception and at the end of primary school um, when they're 10 and 11. And we see one in five children entering primary school obese or overweight, which is a disgrace for public health statistic. How come we've got as a country in a place where a fifth of our children are uh, obese or overweight before they even get to school? A third of them have tooth decay. Tooth decay is it? entirely avoidable. We need to eat less sugary things and brush our kids' teeth a bit more and we'd see a, a decline in those statistics. Um, but what this speaks to is that adult obesity problems, the biggest risk factor for a child becoming overweight or obese is having an overweight or an obese parent. Um, the majority of our children live in households where they have at least one parent obese or overweight. And so that means that the family's eating habits are skewed towards having too many calories. Um, and that's the norm because on average that's what we're doing. Um, so by the time our children en exit primary school, we see one and three of them obese or overweight and that broadly, broadly is the same as in Scotland. We see large socioeconomic gradients in obesity. The most deprived children are, the, are twice as likely to be obese or overweight at either of these ages. But I'm always a bit nervous about talking about the equity issue in this because it kind of drives the narrative, oh, it's about someone else. It's about, it's about people just not quite getting it. And that's not true. When you look at the adult obesity data, you see for women, it is socioeconomically patterned, but kind of only just 20-ish percent of us are obese or overweight independent of our social class, but it just happens to be a higher number in the 20s for the poorest women compared to the most affluent women. And men, it's not socioeconomically patterned at all. So it's a societal problem. Um, Elspeth went through this data. We published 10 days ago, um, I think about 10 days ago, the latest data from the UK's National Data and Nutrition Survey. So this is encompasses data from uh, Scotland. And we see, as Elspeth said, uh, we're consuming, on average, too much saturated fat. The good news is our trans fatty acid intakes are really low. They're well within uh, um, safety guidance. Food industry has taken trans fatty acids out. 
Um, our, our sugar intakes are really very bad. Um, over twice uh, the public health recommendations, our fibre intakes are too low. Our salt intakes to spike coming down are still too low. Our fruit and veg intake is too low. And that's driving a whole myriad of diet-related chronic disease in the population. Um, obesity and diet-related chronic disease now for UK as a whole um, are neck and neck with smoking as uh, leading causes of premature death. This is a serious matter. It's pushing down on our health service. That's why government cares about it, because of the cost to you and me as taxpayers. Um, it's not just about a bit of better food choice, as I've said before. Now, in the national surveys, and indeed in all surveys in the world, we tend to underreport our, our bad behaviours, for want of a better word. Um, and in our nutrition surveys, we underestimate our calorie intakes. Um, three weeks ago, Public Health England published the best estimates we could get using um, isotope methodologies, some of which was developed in the route, actually in Scotland. I know a few from the route in the audience. Um, and um, we used that to give a really quite accurate estimate of uh, calorie excess in the population. So on average, adults are consuming two to 300 calories a day more than they need, uh, assuming that they're weight stable. In fact, that's quite a conservative estimate. That's a lot of calories that you and me, our average, are consuming. But we see for our children, if you look at the uh, overweight and obese kids, so this is the top third of body weights um, for our children, we see up to 500 calories being consumed too much. You can't outrun that. You won't um, get rid of that excess calorie intake by a bit of running around the school playground. That is a large energy imbalance, and it can really only be addressed by cutting calorie consumption. Um, so you may have noticed over the years that government has slightly has distanced the physical activity messaging from the dietary messaging when we talk about solutions to the obesity problem, and that's because of evidence like this, evidence from randomised control trials that says, actually, without cal cutting calorie intake through whatever means, you can't really get to grips with obesity. Um, I kind of talked about most of what's on this slide. Um, I suppose one of the things that constantly get, gets raised is about undernutrition in the population, and by undernutrition, I will crudely just mean those that, those, those that are underweight. It is an ever-decreasing problem. Year on year in our health surveys, we see less and less children um, um, in the underweight category. You expect to see some just because of it. you have a normally distributed population, but actually it's becoming more unusual. Yes, we have it, eating disorders in our population, but in a public health context, Obesity, um, obesity is the major issue. Um, and um, kind of it affects every parameter of life. So this is data for England. So this is economic data. So obviously, because population is lower, it will be smaller for um, Scotland. I don't know the Scottish data. But it's, these are quite conservative estimates. The way we do them in government is quite conservative. But we estimate obesity is costing the NHS 6.1 billion per year. I was amused the other day to hear that Lack of Sleep was, a group of academics has estimated it was costing 40 billion a year. I think those are rather less conservative estimates, ways of doing the maths than we traditionally do in government. I apologize to the sleep specialists in the government are here and they know it's really accurate. Um, so that's, that's because of things like cancer. That's why CRUK, that's why our cancer charities are caring about obesity, because obesity is a major driver of our cancer, of our cancer stats in this country. It's related to a whole range of cancers. Um, and it's an important modifiable risk factor. Um, I'm very aware, though, if we want people to care about obesity, you have to talk about it through the lenses that they care about. So for local government, I'm not quite sure how your social care is paid for in Scotland. In England, it's paid for largely by our local governments. 
and obesity is costing them a whole lot of money because of the caring, for example, for people by, who have type 2 diabetes. Uh, risk, obesity is the main risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes. And um, if you have your foot amputated and so on and so forth, that will mean that you need care and that will cost uh, local ratepayers money. Um, there are also other things to do with employment. Obesity means if you're obese or overweight, you're more at risk for being out of work, you're less likely to get through a job interview, you're more likely to be off, off sick. As a child, you're more likely to be absent from school and that impacts on your learning. Um, and you're more likely to be bullied, which is something to be avoided, really. So I'm going to talk about sugar, now getting to the sugar journey. So in the press, in the last four years, there's been lots and lots and lots and lots of noise going on going on about sugar. There's been lots of lobbying going on, saying sugar's the root of all evil. And then, and then there's been uh, more kind of moderate stuff going on. And then there's been people saying, oh, don't look over here. Sugar is nothing to do with this wretched obesity problem. It's all something else. So we've had a, a journey in the UK about beginning to get some policy grips on, on sugar. And this, these are some of the staging posts in the policy journey. I think the most, in some, the, the platform of all this has been the scientific advice that, that was reviewed by um, our um, scientific advisory committee on nutrition, which is the committee of independent experts that advises the whole of UK government on nutrition and science. Gone are the days where. Um, expert committees could kind of pontificate and come up with their thoughts on what recommendations could be. Recommendations nowadays have to really draw very clearly on scientific evidence. They need to consider the totality, totality of scientific evidence. They can't cherry pick. Um, this committee took, a, this report took a long time because there is a lot of nutrition research. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of nutrition research. They just looked at randomised control trials and prospective cohort studies, so that studies over a long period of time. They didn't look at the lower levels of evidence. Um, because in the history of nutrition, those have been deeply misleading, so now it will be quite unusual for um, a committee like SACEN to consider that evidence. And they drew recommendations that says, there's evidence here to say the previous recommendations on sugar were set too high. They used to say have up to 10% of your calories as sugar. I'm using sugar, sugar, the word sugar as a shorthand for free sugars, those of you who are technical. Um, so they halved the recommendation to 5% um, of energy. And, and they did that because of the prospective studies showing a relationship between high levels of sugar intake um, um, and, uh, and weight gain and the randomised control trials that showed, showed broadly similar results. They also saw the long established relationship that we've known for ages between sugar and dental caries um, uh, through, uh, through uh, prospective studies. Very importantly as well, they looked specifically at um, sugary drinks and very unusually for this committee, they made a recommendation about a food product. Um, they've only done that in the past for fish, I think. Um, and uh, fruit and vegetables. And, and they said, based on the randomised control trials, particularly in children, because of the relationship between sugary sweetened drinks and weight gain um, in children primarily, crossing BMI centiles, that the consumption of sugary sweetened drinks should be minimised. So Sacken's advice went to the, all of UK governments, to all of the health departments in the UK. All of them accepted the advice. And at least in England, our then minister decided to go one step further on sugar sweetened drinks. So she, so she said at the time, sugar sweetened drinks have no place in a child's diet. So at the same time as Sacken publishing their report, uh, no, not at the same time, um, a few months later, Public Health England published a kind of how-to report. Well, if government wants to achieve these recommendations by Sacken, what do you do to, to achieve it? Do you just simply say to the population, 
eat a bit, a bit less sugar, we kind of know that's not going to work. So they looked at the drivers of poor diet and they looked at promotions and advertising, taxation, um, uh, um, the way we procure and buy food and so on and so forth. Um, and um, they and Public Health England, which includes me, made a series of recommendations on actions that the government um, should consider taking if they really want to reduce sugar in, uh, consumption. So that included um, uh, introducing a tax or a levy on sugar sweetened drinks, um, further restricting advertising and marketing, restricting promotions, learning the lesson of sugar and introducing a structured and very, very closely monitored reformulation program um, and various other things. So, of course, um, government, it's all very well for PHE to say it, but ministers then have to decide what to do. Um, and in August 2016, government released its statement on what it would do about childhood obesity and it made a series of recommendations, and it said a series of things, including we're now going to have a sugar levy, which was introduced on sugar sweetened drinks, um, and we're going to introduce a structured reformulation program. And that's what I'm here to talk about. And I've been talking for ages, and I haven't even got to that yet, so I apologise. Um, so, um, in the childhood obesity plan, it said want to see 20% of sugar come out of foods that are providing the most sugar to children's diets. And this, though, is not about children's food. Most children don't eat any food that's got a special child's food label on. Most children are eating food that you and I are eating. So this is about food consumed by everybody under the age of 18, which is exactly the same as you and I. Um, and uh, we published um, last March um, what the recommendations would be and the detailed guidance for, for them. So, in and this was following engagement with the food industry um, and um, a whole series of analysis that PHE undertake, undertook to inform, inform the programme. So, um, a 20% target was set for delivery by 2020 with a 5% reduction in the first year. And it set three options for product reformulation. That's straightforward reformulation where you improve the recipe to take sugar out of the product. Um, it also set targets or guidelines for uh, capping the amount of calories in single serve products. So this is not what's said on the back of the packet. Very often what's said on the back of the packet does not marry with people, what people consume. It's about what we know from our data um, people are consuming at a single occasion. And also, it, the third mechanism was about using the, those powers of promotion to shift um, food purchases towards the healthier options. We also said that um, sugar reduction should be accompanied by no uh, reductions in calories where possible, and there should be no compromises in terms of the overall nutrition quality of the product, saturated fat should not increase, and that salt reduction should be delivered at the same time. Um, so these, these, we have set targets for, or guidelines for nine categories of food. These are providing the most sugar into children's diets, excluding sugar, sugar sweetened drinks. They're covered by the sugar levy. And, um, and when you look at what PHE has done for each of these categories, they've set the targets according to the sales weighted average per 100 grams of product or poor per portion sizes. That is very, very important because it means when you're thinking about breakfast cereals, the top sellers have to reformulate or the targets won't be achieved. So that means, for example, that we were very pleased to hear that Cocoa Pops was going to take 40% of sugar out of the product. Wow, well done, um, and about time too. So anyway, great to see Kellogg's doing that. Um, so the targets were set for these nine categories um, and, um, and then they included retailers, so that's the own brand products you buy out of Tesco's, for example. They included manufacturers, so this is Kellogg's, this is, um, this is, um, uh, this is Nestle, this is all our big food companies. And very importantly, they also include the out-of-home sector, our coffee shops, our 
fast food restaurants, and so on. Um, and that's because, depending on how you count it, they're now providing a, a third to a quarter of our calorie intake in general. It's really important that these are a part of the reformulation journey. We, of course, we eat out for a treat, but we also eat out every single day. Um, and we've seen a massive growth um, in, in this sector, um, and, um, uh, and we need to change the dialogue of it. We need them to be part of the journey. So um, just go back to this a minute. So what's very different about PHE's reformulation program is um, unlike its predecessor, its predecessor, which I can't even say, which is the public health responsibility deal, which wasn't monitored, which was very much about industry leading, it pledging to do things and, and, and doing them or not, but nobody holding them to account. The thing that is very different about the current reformulation program we have is it is very closely monitored. And it's monitored at a food category level, at a sector level, so for retailers, manufacturers on the out of home sector, at a food category level, so for cakes and biscuits and so on, and at a, for the big companies at a company level. So that's a very, very different thing. Public Health England will publish data on all of this um, after Easter um, and where we begin to get a sense for, for is this all working. And if it isn't, government said it will consider other levers. So why am I optimistic about this voluntary programme working? I'm optimistic because of the sugar levy. The sugar levy, um, which Public Health England is also monitoring, the sugar levy, um, I think, has completely changed the relationship of government to the food industry. So um, I've been working for, on salt reduction since the dawn of time. And um, when we used to go to meetings with the food industry on salt reduction, and my FSA colleagues will have experienced this before, um, Companies were very proud about doing salt reduction, but many of them would say, well, what are you going to do to us if we don't do it? And we'd always have to mumble. But now, with the sugar levy, we, I basically don't have to answer that question because it's clearly there as a marker of intent. Nobody is saying what might follow, but it's kind of a bit, a bit of a hint, I think. And, you know, we have seen some great announcements from our drinks industry on taking sugar out of their products. From companies, I have been somewhat surprised that they are taking company sugar out of their products, but good on them. They've stepped up to the challenge and they're doing it. Um, and we will see after Easter just how many, how many of them have done it in, um, in numerical terms. Um, so I've just talked about that. So, if we were just to focus our reformulation efforts on sugar, we'd still be missing out on the lion's share of products that are providing calories into our diets because sugar is only the sweet end of the spectrum. We miss out on ready meals, we miss out on pizzas, we miss out on burgers, we miss out on savoury savory snacks, and so on. So um, a few weeks ago, we published, um, set out an ambition for calorie reduction. And this says, um, similarly to the sugar reduction program, that we want to see a 20% reduction um, in calories in uh, 13 categories of product, which I'll come on to um, um, by, um, over, the next, over the next five years. Um, and we will be developing over the next few months um, targets for individual products that are within the programme and also, no doubt, be setting some portion size caps as well. We'll work closely with industry on it um, and we'll similarly be producing annual progress reports. And this now, now we have, to, for the sugar reduction programme and the products in the calorie reduction programme, we now have 50% of calories um, within, um, within the programme. So that's a lot. These are the 13 categories that we want to see uh, reduced by 20%. Um, and um, I've talked about those really. And this is important because 
of pressure on the NHS. So we estimate that delivering the calorie reduction programme will save 4.5 uh, billion pounds over the next 25 years. Um, and that, so that is separate from the money that we'd estimate that we'd save from the sugar reduction programme. So what's next? We, 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 got, we, we, will get, we will start a whole raft of stakeholder engagement. Um, we, will, we will publish guidance for calorie reduction. We'll publish our progress report. We're also going to publish guidance for drinks excluded from the levy. Milk-based drinks kind of got a bit of a reprieve from the sugar levy. They were taken, they were not included in the sugar levy because the industry made the case that they're nutritionally important. Um, they've now been, will be asked to reduce, they have been asked to reduce their sugar content, so milkshakes reduce their sugar content. And PHE will publish guidance for them shortly. Um, and there's a lot of data coming out, basically that's what this all summarises as. So, it's a long journey. There's possibility, I think, for UK industry to shine in this. There's possibility for Scottish industry to shine in it. And, and um, we hope we're going to see lower sugar, lower energy products going forward. And I know that we will in some areas because industry have told us they're doing it. So thank you very much. very much Alison for such a, a clear description of what you say is a, a long journey already and still mm. with a, a long way to go. If you perhaps come and join me at the, the more comfortable seats <laughs> and uh, comfortable seats but also hot seat and um, I'm sure there will be some uh, questions uh, from the audience. So before going to the technology, are there any questions in the room? There's a lady here in the second row in the middle. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, my name is Celia, I work at Nourish Scotland. Um, this was really interesting, thank you. I'm wondering, because uh, you're talking a lot about calories and sugar and obesity, but should we try and focus the message a bit more on healthy foods and promoting healthier foods, not just foods that contain less bad, bad stuff, but foods that are actually really good for our bodies and reframe the whole debate so that we're not just trying to reduce sh sugar in our diets but really change our food culture and our, our whole diets. So this is a behind the scenes work with the industry. The point of it is that it is behind the scenes. So as a consumer, yes, consumers will know about it because we're shouting out in the media every now and again about it. But this in a way is health by stealth. You haven't noticed your bread is 40% less salty than it was 10 years ago. It is. That's the reality. But we also know, and we will continue to do our healthy, balanced diet messaging. That will remain core of government's business mm -hmm. probably in Scotland too. Yeah. But we know that won't change anything. I if you are focusing your efforts, I mean it very broadly when I say it won't change anything. It will change something for some people. But if you think you're going to so solve Scotland's obesity problem by promoting a balanced diet, we know we've been doing that for years and it hasn't worked. People are so we so so if so we we will encourage industry to put more fruit put more veg in products for example um, uh, but what should those policy actions should be. <laughs> So the evidence on subsidies um, shows, it's very sparse, but the evidence such as it is shows that subsidies on fruit and veg will tend to benefit a middle class consumer more than the poor consumer. We have, as you pointed out, being, um, I'm not sure what happens in Scottish schools, but certainly in English schools, children get free fruit and veg in, in, res in, res in reception. There's um, um, sorry, in, in infants, 
Um, and also we have the House Start scheme. So yeah, fruit and veg are an important part of the mix. Would, we're already spending a lot of money on subsidising fruit and veg. Whether the levy should be spent more on that, I don't know. And I see that gentleman shaking his head. Sorry, sorry. Can we just wait for so, the so the subsidies I'm here. referring to is we give fruit and they would give vouchers to fruit and veg on the Healthy Start scheme, and also we give free fruit and veg to children in 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 our infant school. Would you like to comment on that, sir? I, I was just saying, in terms of overall public policy, it's it's not a huge amount of money. That's all. When you say a lot of money, it sounds like it's we're it's more we're money than we're spending on the uh, than is gathered from the sugar levy. There's more money than we're going to bring in from the sugar levy. And Thank the you. evidence from Healthy Start, certainly the University of York study, was that it did increase consumption um, among people that it was targeted at, which is low-income families. I'm talking about the. I'm talking about the. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the, st the evidence that was reviewed when we looked at the evidence around around taxation and price. So the more experimental studies. Um, so I, it's not a particular. Any rate. Anyway, and there's also <laughs> stuff from this. Yeah, so, so health has yeah. to be part of this. Absolutely, yeah. I do agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think again that comes back to the point that Sir Kenneth Kalman was making this morning about the the need for positive stories as well as negative stories. So there's a a mixture of interventions that are going to be important in the in this journey that we are on. I'm good. There's a couple of questions coming up on the screen, and I think they'll be particularly of interest to some of our industry representatives. So I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll peer and read them. <laughs> Food brands worry about the impact on the, their bottom line of reformulation. Do you know of any case studies which show increased profits for brands which have changed? Um, I, um, no, that's, but in a way that's not my business. I mean, we've been, it is interesting. So one of the things I've noticed in this is that com global companies that are based in the UK, are very proud about the work they're doing in the UK and are shouting that out to the parts of the business that are overseas. And every country is beginning to think about this. Not every country, but many countries are beginning to think about this. Dialogue going on in Europe. I was at a WHO thing last week where it's being discussed. Um, we know other, com other companies, are countries are taking action in different ways. This is a global health problem. Um, so, so um, we we want to, so we want to continue to have vibrant Brit British business, absolutely. But we also do need to get to grips with the calorie problem we have in the have in the UK. So, and th there's another related question here, which I think uh, uh, almost uh, has uh, flip sides to it. So, I think Alison, you mentioned in your in your talk, you were very pleased to hear that Kellogg's were taking 40% sugar out of Cocoa Pops, so that's a, a good news story. It uh, possibly answers the first part of that question in terms of setting a, a good example in terms of reformulation. The next point is, I guess the flip side, are there any which are particularly resistant to the types of changes that you're trying to encourage? I mean, it's very difficult to know at the moment because um, it is very <coughs> early days of the programme. I'm very aware, so Public Health England are using shopping basket data to um, see how this is going. And that's what you purchase. It's not what's coming out of the factories. There's quite long supply lines. Um, some companies will tell us what they're doing. Some companies won't. Um, the truth will be in the data, but this year's data is quite early on, so next year's data will be um, is more important in many ways. Okay, there's uh, a few hands going up. So I see uh, Professor Morgan from the Rarit, and then the lady in front with uh, with curly hair. Okay, so Al Alison, what have you? Anyone modelled what you expect to see happen? So in other words, you're taking calories hopefully out the diet. Do we you, does it, do we have any anticipated timescales at which we might see some positive effect in Change terms of weight? Hmm? A, a quite a long time. I mean, it takes us a long time to become overweight. This is taking a proportion of calories out. Um, it's, it's at the moment, there are, there's that and the levy, which are really being the strong poli policy interventions. More policy interventions come on online. Then. So, I, 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 uh, so, yes, behind the scenes, we have done some modeling. Um, I don't know if anybody else has done it. We haven't published that uh, because of all the possible counterfactuals you can have going on. But you might see earlier effects in children. Is that possible? 
we would expect to see earlier effects in children. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the lady just in front of you with the curly hair. Hi, Alison. I'm Nikki Motiang from the Union Advertising Agency. We work for Food Standards Scotland and also Scottish Government on Eat Better, Feel Better. I was interested to hear what you said about um, out-of-home eating. That's something that we're working on at the moment um, and that whilst it's a treat, it's also something that people do every day. I just wanted to, to ask you what you thought about how people perceive that because when we talk to people, they do say it's a treat. And it is something they do every day, but they don't necessarily see a sort of tension in that, the, you know, the idea of having a treat every day. So there's kind of some work to be done there. And any, any thoughts on that would be really yeah, there's welcome. Clearly, I mean, we saw it all in the TNS data, Kantar data, this disconnect between um, what we know and what we do. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, we, we have been quite open, I think, you have in Scotland about wanting to see calorie labelling um, on, on menus. We have some data now from a Cochrane review. Um, we think that would be helpful. We don't think it will solve the issue, but we think at least that would begin to um, level out the um, information, basic information we have co as consumers can get from our products we buy in retail, from our products we can buy from our manufacturers, and are those very big companies that are providing us with a lot of calories um, on our high street to eat on the go. I think there's another question here. Hi, I'm Bauke de Roos from the Rowett Institute. Um, obesity is not like a UK problem, and a lot of the companies you're working uh, or you're talking to are global companies as well. I just wonder how, how the kinetics work of kind of you obviously kind of uh, looking at, at England, but there will be other countries looking at similar problems. Do you talk to each other? Do you discuss strategies? Do you set, because you, you put some ambitious targets there, do you discuss that? Do you align that, or just do you look at England only? How does that work? So, um, so we we do all know each other <laughs> to some extent, a bit like academia, really. Um, and um, I would say at the moment that the UK is leading. What we saw in salt was the UK really started the the um, government's work on salt, and it then got picked up by the EU, and then got picked up by WHO, and now a lot of countries have salt reduction programs. Many, many countries are more in the responsibility deal space for nutrition, so that's the kind of the old thing we had in England pre the uh, Childhood Obesity Plan, which was about a pledging response. Um, there's discussions going on in Europe, certainly on a more structured reformulation approach, and we are being approached a lot um, in the UK. I think the thing that's different about the UK is we have the NHS which very clearly we're all paying for, and it's also very data rich. We also have lots of data. So that sharpens the mind a bit. Most countries don't have that, but um, we are being spoken to a, a lot. Whether I think North America will be speaking to us soon, probably not. <laughs> uh, there's two questions here. One first on this row, and then a lady in the, um, in the row behind. Hi there, uh, I'm Kimberly from Lanarkshire Community Food and Health Partnership Charity Organisation and I just wanted to ask a bit more about reformulation um, with regards to salt. Um, one of the benefits that I feel is that the length of time that that was allowed to gradually decrease. Um, when it came to the um, sugar and I think just when you're saying health by stealth, I think definitely with the salt. However, with the sugar, um, Levy, there was a bit of um, resentment from people. I'm thinking of Iron Brew in particular, you know. Um, and what I was wondering was, do you think that it would have been beneficial to allow a longer time frame for some companies, uh, for example, some were doing it um, Tesco's of gradually reducing the fizzy drinks by 5% and with that perhaps um, also reducing um, that, that preference for sweet um, taste and less likely to have um, arguments for artificial sweetener set aside, but perhaps um, reducing that preference for sweet tasting foods and doing it more of a, um, a longer journey, um, gradual reduction. Um, well, salt could have been faster. Um, it, we learnt a lot doing salt that we're applying to this, and salt could have been faster. 
Um, we will, in, in our reports, we will publish, we will say what companies have got in the pipeline, <coughs> if they've chosen to tell us, um, and we'll also say what they've done pre the reformulation program, so we won't penalise the leaders. So I spoke about Kellogg's. In some ways, it's not fair I speak about Kellogg's because there were companies out there, mm -hmm. breakfast cereal companies, who were doing it long before Kellogg's. And frankly, Kellogg's have got a long way to go in some, because um, they have done less over the years. Um, so um, it's an imperative, though, because of the health burden. Type 2 diabetes is yeah. serious for you as a taxpayer, yeah. serious for, for our society. Um, so we don't have the luxury of kind of waiting 10 years. Um, we know that taste buds adapt rapidly. That's one reason I was saying we perhaps could have done salt quicker. But we were learning, and companies were learning as well as that was going on. Companies knew sugar was coming. Anybody who stood out in the street kind of knew it was coming. Um, and Iron Brew were taking sugar out of their products. <coughs> Hooray! I did go out to lunch with them before, up my word. <laughs> a bit stressful. Uh, Claire's got a comment there. I think we've but got good time. for them. Yeah. Really good on Iron Brew. Yeah. Hi, um, Claire Hislop from NHS Health Scotland. I'm organisational <coughs> lead for diet and obesity. So my question was around the kind of categories that you've chosen for selection around obviously sugar and then calorie reduction through the reformulation. And you haven't included the, the first sort of set of categories which was for sugar reduction, then within the calorie reduction. And I just wondered what the kind of reasoning behind that was. Is it because we expect that the sugar will reduce the calories? Or is, th is there some other reason behind that? Well, it may, in s it will in some categories. It won't in others, like in breakfast cells, it won't because you really have to replace it with a starch. We didn't want to double it. We have to, industry are really important to us. We don't want to double hit them. It's possible that some categories will morph into calories over the time. For example, cakes and biscuits is a case for saying they may be better off in a calorie reduction program than a sugar reduction program because it gives industry more options. But really it was about fairness, about trying to kind of um, give different parts of industry clear things and not expect double things. We actually expect salt to form them all. So not to expect three things of, of the whole of industry to maintain a bit of focus, but of course the decisions to be made. The categories are all selected from what are providing the most into the diet, so it's kind of a logical, analytical approach to that. Mm. I should say actually, because keep, people keep on saying they're from the NHS or they're from Blar or somewhere, one of the big things to pull these things down into acceptability is that we all work with our providers of food so many of you will have control over public procurement contracts that, that you are involved in. Um, and, um, and good nutrition standards in there is very important for pulling, for helping to yeah. pull all this through. And um, I have my own little bits of leadership on this. I never speak at conferences with an unhealthy catered anymore. Well, I have a minimum. There are things you can't get them to do. But there's no point, and some of you know some of you are academics working um, in nutrition or on obesity. It, it doesn't make any sense to rock up to an obesity conference and there to be on healthy catering there. Just won't go there yeah. anymore. And we can all do that as yeah. uh, in our own little leadership space. Absolutely, and I think that um, absolutely chimes with things we've been talking about in mm -hmm. Scotland in terms of us as public bodies really leading by example. So the in NHS. The things that we do. Yeah. You, you know, there's clearly been some progress, great to see more. There's one more question left on the board, and I think it's a, a, a good one for, uh, to, to, to leave Alison with, I think. Um, we're expecting a childhood obesity plan part two from UK government. What do you hope it might contain? <laughs> Can we put you on the spot in such a way? Well, that's supposed to be top secret, so I don't know what it's doing up there. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, Jamie Oliver has been talking about it relatively, well, very openly, actually. <laughs> um, uh, well, I hope it's going to have, have some big things in it, things that, structural things. If we, we, we obviously, in policy, ha um, know we always end up with a mixture of um, kind of light, soft things, and we hope some difficult, some harder to achieve things in there. I hope there are going to be some 
hard to achieve things in there which will truly benefit the population. Um, PHE has been very open mm -hmm. in 2015 about what we wanted to see. We obviously didn't get um, further restrictions on advertising. The evidence does support that. The evidence supports further restrictions, well, some restrictions on promotions. Um, um, and my gosh, we could do better in the public sector mm -hmm. um, about the amount of the kinds of food we sell, um, the way, and we could do better in our schools. In early years, um, in our nurseries, our children deserve better food. I think that's a, a really good note on which to end. It's been a, a great discussion. Um, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to Alison for being so, so clear and open and honest with us. And she, she is able to stay for a little while longer, but she does have to leave before the end of the conference. So if you could just please thank Alison for her <laughs> contribution. To